Hello, welcome to Endgame. Today, we're talking about Ready Player One, the movie. It's filled with spoilers, so if you haven't seen it, go watch it or don't. And if you want, so, but just remember, there's lots of spoilers. I'm obviously Parsifal and not Nikki. So many spoilers. <laughs> All right, thank you. Our spoilers um, have spoilers. Yeah, we're going to spoil the movie, but I think we've given it two weeks. That's plenty of time for everyone to have seen Ready Player One, so we're going to spoil the hell out of it. And give a review right. from within the metaverse. Like, we, we live here, and they're giving us this vision of the future, so we'll talk about it. Um, this is Endgame. This week, I'm joined by Lao Z and Xerxes, who have both seen the movie, right? You guys saw the movie, right? Mm -hmm. No, multiple times. <laughs> that would be a big mistake. I've never um, even read the book. What, you, what am I doing? Here? God. <laughs> so we'll talk about the movie, and then we'll compare it to the book, and then finally we'll sort of project out into the future and critique how accurate it is. But let's start from the movie. There. So, yeah, Lau, how, how did you like just the movie experience? So I thought uh, I enjoyed it. I thought they made a lot of changes, and I thought the changes made sense. Transitioning book to movie, there was stuff in the book that would not have worked in the movie. The way they adjusted the movie made sense. And I really liked, especially what they did with giving Artemis more of a role because she didn't have much of a role in a book. Uh, so yeah, overall, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it. I thought it was a, a well done. All right, awesome, Xerxes. What about you? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with everything that you just said there, especially Artemis. I feel like her her actor brought so much enjoyment to the role, especially in the Oasis. Um, I mean, along with that, I, I went into the movie with pretty. A pretty low bar set and it blew it out of the water i, I could not <laughs> imagine yeah like i was giggling i had this sense of childlike wonder through the entire thing so i mean if uh they really really did an amazing job with it oh that's really good to hear I, i'm hoping you'll sort of lead the discussion here like because i've talked to a few people and no one was sort of crazy about it and like i thought it was good but like um, I don't know. My expectations have changed over time. And I was talking to the kids at school today. So these are younger people who I assume the movie is young targeted people. at. Um, <laughs> it, well, it, it's, it's a young person's movie, right? It's like, not, I wouldn't say it's <laughs> no, a kid's it's like, movie it's necessarily. Like, it's but... like an 80s nostalgia person's book. Well, it's an 80s nostalgia person's book. Uh, it might be a, for the, it might be a little, go a little younger with all the references they added, but no, it's it's always pitched as like yeah, if you're like a kid of the '80s, it's for you. And like young people, are like what the heck is you know what the heck is War Games? I've never seen that movie. That's so <laughs> true. But didn't the way that they made the movie, like the way that Spielberg did it, didn't it feel like it was a throwback? To oh those yeah, old they definitely made movies? it more like... topical to later generations. Yeah, they they throw in a bunch of stuff, modern stuff, uh, more recent stuff. So, and that was another good thing the movie did. I thought. But also just like the plot and the the adventure element, like I felt like it sort of, I don't know, it mirrored a lot of the movies it was referencing, like the Goonies at the end, I felt. And like, I don't know, there mm -hmm. were little things like that that felt, that reminded me of those movies I saw when I was young and sort of, like, that's why I'm so glad to hear that you sort of, got, it washed over you and you had that child come out because that's, I think, what we all wanted, right? In a um, way that was like, it was meta like that. And especially, and, I mean, this is a spoiler. <laughs> or we are spoiling this, right? We're spoiling. Yes, I mean, okay. spoiling everything. Oh my God, dies. especially the ending no, when he's about to shoot <laughs> Z in the van and then sees the childlike wonder and goes and the little faint smile. And then like the music playing and he gets put into the cop car. Like that is just- You're talking about such... Sorrento. <laughs> Sorrento, end, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so... yeah. Uh, Nolan Sorrento. Like that is just so- cheesy and i i've heard people explain <laughs> that right. they hated that that they You're hated totally that but right. like if i'm looking at it i'm like this is so meta like this is that's just 80s, completely meta that's 80s cheese definitely that's how the 80s movies ended yeah yeah you're exactly right. exactly <laughs> i'm curious like how many people here were around in the 80s but we don't have to take that poll but what i do want <laughs> is to ask people basically for their general review in emojis before we keep going so can oh, just everyone who's seen right. it can we do a, a big thumbs up well, if ghoster's got to pan around first so the, so the stream yeah, can see, a general see positive the review or a thumbs down if you have generally a negative review about the movie should we do it too or, or should we just let them do it yeah everybody let's have everybody do it just so we can see the chat all right give us give us a countdown oh give yeah we're supposed to count number. Okay, one, two, three. Okay. Oh, wow. All right, we're not mostly all right. positive. Everybody can stay. I was worried we'd have to kick some people, but we're fine. Okay, it's good. <laughs> no, I thought there was a I'm lot more. Surprised. I'm gatekeeping. No, not really. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Zerkin. <laughs> I'm surprised that a room full of people in virtual reality have such a, a high opinion of a of this movie. Um, but no, for real, like the the main people who I've seen have problems with it are the ones who are like deeply into the book and deeply into like virtual reality and going, oh, it was nothing like it. So I'm really surprised that there were all those thumbs ups. 
Yeah, that's a relief. Hmm. Um, I think that, Andrew, did you have your hand up before we took that poll? What were you going to say? No, uh, I was just saying I, I, I was yeah. around in the 80s and I listened oh, to the you're just saying you're around. It was terrific. Well, mm. Okay, that's awesome. Um, Chair, okay. Eight. Does anyone have like their own short review of it? There was one really good one in the chat and I forget who, who it was. Uh, I wonder if there's just the, talking about the movie. Oh, yeah, it was. But is he not here? I don't see him. What did he say, anyways? He said it was like, he used some kind of analogy about a loaded gun or something. I don't remember, but it was a good analogy. Oh, yeah, no, he sure. said it was like, it was a, it was a weak gun, like it fi fired, fired all its round, but it was like a, a weak gun, something like that. It was, it was, it was faint, it was faint praise. Is what it had yeah. read to me. That's what I. That's what I expected <laughs> from the general audience. I thought we were all going. I was worried this was just going to be like a nitpicking nightmare of us just taking apart each little thing God, that we no. didn't think held up. Uh, so I'm glad we're we're generally doing better than that. Um, yeah. One thing I I, I have to well, I kind of go went in to it thinking it was going to be like a crappy video game movie, kind of like um. <laughs> Super Mario Brothers, the Super Mario Brothers movie, or Tomb Raider. Don't call that movie crappy, dude. Oh, yeah. Super Mario yeah. Brothers. <laughs> oh, but my anyway, God. That's a whole you know, other level. Kinda, you know, I was, I, my bar was at, like, video game movie level. You know, that was my bar. And, this is, like, the ultimate you know, and that's video why game I, movie. And I, that's, why, that's why I liked it so much, because it was, first of all, not even in that category, and just kind of all the way out of it. And I, that's why I, th I liked it. So how did they break through that ceiling? What what made this a success? Because I agree, I, I had my I low bars because video game movies don't do good. The eighties. It wasn't about video games. It was more about the eighties than anything else. Right. So we're we talking about what made it successful, the book or the movie? Because I think it's I think it's very different, and I think the book has also gotten a lot. Like when the book came out in two thousand one, it was fine. Like people thought, oh, how you know that's a that's a fun little novel for a certain population. That's great. And then, you know, fast forward eight years, and now everybody's like, oh, it's toxic. It's about toxic communities. Like, the, everybody has these incredibly strong opinions on it, uh, you know, and people have different thoughts on why that is. But, like, when the book came out, it was it was pretty much just people were like, no, oh, that's a decent book. Yeah. Wait, when, when did it come out? You say 2001? 2001, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I might, somebody I can thought it was it and correct more me. Recent. But I'm, is it 2011 or is it one? Anybody? But, yeah, uh, I think but it, I think it's, it was more recent than 2001. Uh, maybe it was 2011. I know there's a one in there. So either way, I'm probably wrong. But either way, it had been out for a number of years. DK1 was announced. Yeah. I so saw Agent it, M83 um, had an uh, exclamation emoji if he had something to say. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Do you know, I, do you know really the date? Sure. I, I don't know the date. <laughs> okay. Um, way, I, I do years. believe that it was earlier than you would anticipate. <laughs> um. I don't know if it was so early as 2001, but yeah, I, well, I okay. it, it is, um, I think it is right. 2011. Uh, keep mm -hmm. in mind, though, okay. like VR books have been around since way before that, like early 90s oh, yeah, totally. when people yeah, started totally. writing about mm -hmm. VR and things like that. Mm -hmm. so it wasn't. Yeah, too. it's just interesting to me to see how the the like I said when 2001 came out, you know, there was there was not the controversy. Like we talked, you talked about people expecting expecting people to hate the movie like go on the internet go on any internet comment form anywhere and say like i liked ready player one and just ready for the flame wars to start yeah or adversely yeah. say <laughs> i hated ready player one and be ready for the flame wars to start like it wasn't like that when it first came out and now it's like this big thing so and the movie's done really yeah. well it's it's i think it's made a hundred million dollars in america and 400 million worldwide after mm -hmm. two weeks as like 74 yep. percent on rotten tomatoes so that's like pretty positive mm, pretty good. Um, well the movie improved a lot on the book i mean the book was for a certain population like some people you know i, I honestly I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna i think i'll upset everybody here so be prepared <laughs> i'm actually gonna i'm actually gonna compare ready player one to twilight um okay in the sense that <laughs> so, so and, and here's why so let me let me explain before i before i do that so twilight was incredibly popular you know, with young girls and, 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 and it was great. You know, it was, it was for them, it was written for them, right? People saw it as, as, Hey, this, they're enjoying this. This is great. It's something that they like. It caters to kind of what they like to see in books. And initially it was fine, but then it got real big and all of a sudden it became, you know, super edgy to like hate on twilight. Like, Oh yeah. How can you like twilight? It's terrible. You know? And there was this, this big divide where people were like, Oh, twilight is just directed to this particular audience. And people wanted to be angry at people for liking it, you know, which was incredibly, you know, I, th I think that's such a lost opportunity. You had so many young fans getting into, you know, SFF 
in general who might have read Twilight and gone on to read other things, but because they got this incredibly negative backlash over liking this thing, you know, that may have turned them off, which is talks it deals a little in the gatekeeping things that, you know, have kind of made Ready Player One a, a controversial book later. Not because it supports that, but because people see it that way. Um, but yeah, so I think Ready Player One now has a similar distinction where it is like the original book was kind of made for like like literally the, the hero's superpower is knowing 80s pop culture, right? If you're a kid who was born in the 80s, that's cool to you, to that particular subset. Um, to other people, they'd be like, that's, why would I want that? So, and mm -hmm. at the time the book came out, that was fine. But later on, it began to be a stand-in for all of these other conversations that we were having on the internet about toxic fandom and gatekeeping and all these other issues. To, so it's, there's been a lot of baggage added to it since its initial release. See. Interestingly enough, uh, when I was like reading through the book, it appealed to me not because he was an 80s know-it-all, but that he was a character in an MMO. I'm a 90s mm -hmm. kid myself, so the 80s stuff didn't really like light my torch or anything, but I felt like I could really be like, man, you know, I, I thinking back on the days when I was playing World of Warcraft and, and I was interacting in kind of the ways that he was, that's the main appeal and draw to me. And it's almost in a weird way when you say that it's what it's appealing to. For me, like, if I were to say, oh, I'm a gamer, there were a lot of things that they, they chose to do that I was like, that's just unrealistic. So I actually kind mm -hmm. of thought that mm -hmm. it was it was trying to appeal to a more general audience which made me happy because i think that we need more general audience to, to view it uh, in yeah. order for vr to kind of kick off so but the, the people who more uh, kind of associate themselves with gamer identities tended to not like it as much for those reasons i think yeah and mm. honestly the, i think the other thing i want to mention just what actually drew me into the book was not even the gaming aspects i mentioned that but i i, I don't know i mean i'm not going to i'm not going to ask anybody to speak up but i would just be curious I bet there's there are some people in here who are probably bullied in school because if you were in mm. if you liked you know nerdy stuff in the 80s or the 70s like it was not it was not as you know as widespread or cool. mainstream as it is now and you know a lot of people got picked on or even if you didn't like it people get picked on that's just the way school is and so I had that experience when I was young and when Wade is talking about going to school in the Oasis and how happy he is that he could be in this virtual environment where like there's this bully trying to you know kind of get a rise uh, out of him and he just he just you know gives it makes a <clears> comment <throat> that pisses him off and mutes him and walks off completely free of repercussions yeah. like just the fantasy of oh going to school in virtual reality like that immediately hooked me like that's i would have as as a child who you know in high school in elementary school had that experience i was like oh that's great so it wasn't even the video game aspect at that point. Oh man, I, I want to talk about right. the school some more, but but before because that's going to go into the book. Before that, I, like the thing that hooked me was actually different too. It was it was and the nostalgia factor. Explanation point over oh, there. So I'll get to you in a second. Like the the remix factor, which is like you were mentioned or Publipo was saying that like this is not a new genre. Like we've had these sort of metaverses or you know different virtual reality books before. But what was unique to this for me was sort of oh the, you know all these characters like you know on the wall there's all these movie posters and they would all show up and you'd be in the DeLorean. It was like this. You know, it was this super nostalgia, like mixing all these genres together. And I found that really exciting when the book came out, which is just a few, you know, I, I've read that maybe like five or six years ago. And I think mm. since then, my attitude has changed. Like, I feel like at that time I was revved up for like remix culture and for all these things to collide. And now I think I'm a little bit we tired of it. My door, Dad. <laughs> and I think that I think there's a lot of people that are tired of it too. Like I think it's the the book coming out at, came out at a different time than the movie. I think it was like a little bit more exciting to mix everything together. And I think that today it might already be a little bit old. Like the idea of because with memes and everything, like we're so used to just all pop culture getting jammed together and, and remixed and you know globbed together or whatever. And so I don't know. That's what I've seen change. Who who, who did you say had a question or a comment? It's Shadow. Oh yeah, Shadow. Shadow. Yeah, so I really like uh, for, first a few things. Um, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, I read the book twice. The first time I read it, um, I was born in '92, so I, I didn't really get the '80s stuff the first time I read it. So I almost hated the book the first time because it seemed like superfluous and esoteric for no reason. I'm just like, what? What is all this crap? You know, I couldn't understand. It. Um, I just liked the VR part um, aspects of it. And then um, a couple of years later, when I heard the movie was coming out, I read the book again, and then I got more into it. And I really appreciated it. Not not really for the, I guess, the geek factor of the 80s stuff, because I still barely get it. But I appreciated how much passion went into it. 
and how much they tied into it in, in regards to um, VR and in general. And um, since then, I've read a lot of other VR MMO type, you know, uh, light novels and books and stuff like that. And so that kind of um, influenced my, my thoughts. So when I went to go watch the movie, I actually watched it with uh, my girlfriend. And she's like, she's a geek, but she's not at all into like, you know, this this sort of geekery of, of that the book, you know, and the, and the movie is all about. So when she watched it, it was like it was like seeing it from two different perspectives. For me, I was like almost excited like a child watching all the VR stuff and all the effects and how they visualize everything, even though they left a lot of stuff out that I didn't really appreciate. At the same time, I, I was just excited the whole time. While she was looking at it, she was like, what is this emoji movie part two? I was just like, oh, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> like, oh, I, can, I, I can definitely, <laughs> yeah, I can definitely see that because like what you said with the mashing of cultures thing, it kind of got old at this point. And so uh, with the movie, they did a great job of generalizing it um so that people weren't so um lost in all the references but at the same yeah. time they kind of had a, a you know it was a double-edged sword with all the the mashups of, of references um that's topical now but in a few years it's going to be like you know what is that what, what's the point in putting that there so um i just think it was very interesting in, in the time that it came out and um what they did add in and what they took out i'm, I'm curious too for other people who went with somebody who's completely unfamiliar with any of this stuff like vr video games metaverse like how they reacted because i i, I do want to get into how this is going to affect the mainstream and like for people who aren't hanging out in vr chat i wonder what this movie is, is telling them yeah um, and to add somebody... on to that question do you know people who have like now become interested to a degree that they're willing to purchase vr like has yeah, yeah. yeah. i always i, I always want to make the top gun happen. comparison that's that's what i wish vr chat had done so mm. you guys, you guys know about what Top Gun? Do you remember Top Gun from from the eighties? Sure. So, sure. so what? So if, for anybody who who doesn't know, I believe I think pretty sure it was it was the Air Force. So the movie was about naval aviators, but the Air Force was one of the ones who capitalized it, where people got out of Top Gun and the Air Force actually had recruiters standing outside the theaters, and people would be super revved up about the jets, and they'd be like, "Hey, son, did you like that movie about jets? You want to join the Air Force?" And they got like a massive, <laughs> you know, influx of recruits. So I was, I kind of wish that like VR chat had had like reps outside of theaters showing Ready Player One. <laughs> they and, like, should be selling like, headphones. Hey, did like, you like the Oasis? You, you the should theater. be playing VR chat. Like here's a, you know, I wish, I wish well, they'd done that. I think that would have been hilarious. And you don't even need a campaign to have a kind of subtle effect that we might not see until we look back in the next 10 years. But I remember after the movie Contact with Jodie Foster came out, apparently there was a spike mm -hmm. in female uh, participation in STEM fields uh, just from yeah. having a movie that was able to, um, you know, like give a, a role to, to someone who might not have had that in the public spotlight for so long. So I'm, I'm really, that's what I wanted for this movie to come out. And, and that's why this question really fascinates me it's interesting how much we get affect like how much mainstream culture gets affected by like those big movies and like if we're in like a little niche we sort of don't see it happening like we you know we we know references we know video games we don't care and we, we're not seeing like how it's changing out there in the in the mainstream um internationally saw, too so, yeah yeah wait there was somebody over there was it you agent did you have a i think comment? it was agent yeah um i had so a disclaimer, I, I might be wrong, and um, I have a a different desire in the place of this, but something that I kind of wanted walking into the movie, and ultimately, I guess, the book too, but less so, um, that is a missed opportunity, is for it to, to be what you guys are describing for general audiences for VR, because it's about VR, but it, it, I felt like the, the film and enjoyment of it are significantly more dependent upon uh, like cinematic literacy and more, more focused on mm. movie references. Like there, there were other pop cultural references in the movie, but the way that it's constructed, that it's made by Spielberg in Spielbergian style is all specifically um, like it's, it's still a movie made by a filmmaker about movies and filmmaking disappointingly rather than a movie based upon something that's explicitly about vr and your experience of it is more um even thematically centered on that like it's it's still even a movie really about how spielberg has made movies in his career it, it's centrally yeah. like th th thematically fixated on the notion of looking back holding on to the past 
it tries to like for most of the movie it convinces you that authenticity over reality um artifice over materiality can be a viable alternative to trauma and past events that you you wish you could turn the clock back on and then the very end totally contradicts that <laughs> and tries to tell oh, me yeah. like oh only reality is real i'm like yeah you you don't even buy that spielberg <laughs> I, like you, you spent the entire movie arguing against that very proposition uh, yeah, that was a weird. In, in any ending. case, I, I'm I'm really into stories about virtual reality explicitly. Right. Um, yeah, I have I, I've I've that. mentioned in the. Yeah, well said. Please, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, no, no, no. Keep going. I just meant you're. Please, please keep going. I just meant I I agreed with you and I had some thoughts on what you said, but continue. Oh, oh, I, I was only about... briefly going to to conclude that I I mentioned in the Discord before. Um, as a, a current uh, contemporary alternative narrative that is more even even thematically centered on virtual reality right now is a, a British television series called Kiss Me First uh, I saw a that, oh, really? that just released a, a week ago. I found that very interesting and more hmm. enthusiastic about virtual reality, personally. That's a good but recommendation. I, I still I like the movie, yeah. just not for the reasons that I wanted to. <laughs> Um, mm. yeah. mm -hmm. If that yeah, makes I any sense. Totally, I think that's a totally valid uh, critique. What were you going to add to that? Uh, I was well, going to say. I don't know. Oh, if we we might ahead. not have time for it. It might be. It might be a topic for another show. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about with Ready Player One specifically that Popopo kind of touched on too is the fact that, as you said, the message at the end is like, oh, well, you should spend time in reality, right? You know, reality is better, and like it's just tacked on at the end, and the entire movie kind of contradicts that. Uh, and so that's actually something that I'm, I really want to get, you know, some discussion about uh, if, and, and I, I do feel that if VR continues to progress as it has, uh, I think it's very plausible in 30 years, we could all be in VR uh, for quite a, quite a bit of our lives. If, you know, if you can go, if it becomes photorealistic, if we have, you know, we can, we have senses like, you know, obviously you can't eat, but you'll have, uh, you know, maybe smell, maybe touch, you know, all these senses that we have now, and you'll be able to go to these amazing worlds and do this amazing stuff. Why wouldn't you be in there? And so then my question is, the 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 typical sci-fi bent is that's dystopian, right? It's bad if everyone is in VR is all the time. But is it? Could you make mm -hmm. the argument that there could be a utopian aspect to it? So if we mm -hmm. have time to talk about that, I'd like to. If not, it might be a good topic for another show. Uh, well, well, I think we, that's the we third should question. come back around to that. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get there. Um, but I agree with you. What were you going to add? Well, what I was saying is that um, that's pretty much the third question. We were going to talk about the movie, our initial impressions, go on to how it differed from the book, and then ask, well, how do we think this uh, this came across overall? And I think mm -hmm. really, like, everything you just said there and everything that Agent said as well, this is all indicative of a deeper uh, desire to really kind of get into the nitty gritty aspects of how society is going to react to virtual technology. And in a, in a world where World of Warcraft had 12 million people playing it, we saw all of the articles on addiction, like 18 million on MMOs. At their, height, right? at, their, at their peak, I, it was something like 18 million? Maybe. I feel like it was around 14 at Wrath, and that's when I was playing off at good old days. Yeah. Um, so, small like... Right there. And, and so I actually have a podcast that's about building the oasis. How is this going to emerge itself within our society? And, and I, that's really the third question. That's why we're here to talk today. Um, mm -hmm. And I just kind of wanted to bring that up too. Well, let, let's, before we get there, let's, let's go back to the, to the book. Cause we haven't really talked enough about that. Like, is there anything that you want to talk about as far as the changes that were made? Like specifically, like when you're talking about Spielberg, I, I don't know what to blame on Spielberg or not, but like, there are some little changes that they that they made that like really rubbed me the wrong way, and I yeah I guess really? it'd be very forgiving because it's really hard to translate any you know any book into a movie. You have to like mm -hmm. condense it down to maybe an unrealistic you know size. But yeah. um, like when you're talking about like okay, so well let's let's start with the, the school. Challenges. Yeah. Uh, well, the, mm -hmm. the challenges were all gone, but the part that I was really disappointed <laughs> with that the school was missing, like. They, mm -hmm. they skip over all that stuff yeah. and they go right to the fact that it's a video game and they spend most of the movie, it, you're, it's a video game. Like it, it's not showing you the other parts of society that it might fill in the holes for. Right. So and I think so, there's like, a good I reason for that though. That too. Like, I don't know. So oh, well, go ahead and I'd be curious what your critiques are. Cause I have some thoughts on, on why they might've done that. Like I felt it was actually well adapted, but 
so is the school well, not doing the school what else specifically because like of the way it's going to be received right like i want to sell mm -hmm. vr as not just yeah, a gaming okay. device right i want it to be like no mm -hmm. this is an education this is an experience device like it's more than just video sure. games and in the, the movie it seemed like it was mostly just video games like that was pretty mm -hmm. much what they were doing yeah uh, it wasn't so their was purpose to sell vr i think i think agent is is right that that it was not it, 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 VR is a, it's, it features VR, so that's nice. But it, it's it was to tell an adventure and to make an interesting story, not to not to show the benefits of VR necessarily. So, uh, but Rubik, uh, and that would be a different movie. Really? Oh yeah, do we have one over here? This is why, mainly in my opinion, the the movie is not going to do anything for VR, is because they only took it as a video game, and so. VR is going to be taken as a video game by all the people who don't know about it, and it's not going to be interesting for them because it's video games. So, you know, why would I bother if video games already suck or you know, boring or whatever? So, yeah, if like you look it's, at it's the... It's just going to attract the gaming crowd, which I don't it's care already, about. Yeah. I want to attract everyone else. <laughs> well, it's my hope. It's always been my hope. Uh, and I think that it did happen, that audiences would leave going, oh, hey, that, that's interesting. Maybe it doesn't sell VR completely, but maybe they get onto Google and they search Oasis and then my podcast well, comes up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just or VR chat, yeah, in game. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you know. <laughs> uh, but I think too, like, and this kind of has a little bit, uh, this, this brings up some of the problems that I do have with the movie outside of the actual, like, movie critiques that you could come up with. But Wade almost seems like an even more two dimensional character in the movie because the little backstory that we have about him in the book really comes from his experience as his, his education and everything. In the movie, it's like, oh, I'm Wade, my you know, superhero dad, blah, blah, blah. They died, and it's been mm -hmm. bad but in the book it's like i'm way when i was old enough to wear vr goggles i was in these virtual like sesame street uh interactions i yeah, learned he was taught, I wrote by, he was taught in virtual reality from from a child mm -hmm. which is really interesting i right. thought that was a great a great point yeah mm -hmm, exactly and then we go in to see <laughs> the entire world of Luddis. We learn about the school system and everything. And that was the thing too. They showed Luddis in the movie, but like a, just a tantalizing fly through in the very beginning. And I'm like, that has the potential to like, he could have been there, but that would have been an extra 20 minutes showing Wade in the school, interacting with this guy, getting this mm -hmm. test, not really caring. A TV show. Yes. Yeah, we yeah, talked right. about this in the discord. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it would have really been great. Would have done that instead, but yeah, if it I can see why they did they totally could have done that, but it, it was a two hour movie. So yeah, they had to, they had to pick. So yeah, I think exactly. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you like, I can't, you know, they, they, he's allowed to make those changes. Like, I think it's just a personal preference. I, I would have strongly preferred the school, like opening for 20 minutes at the school and not have, not having the race. But I think that's just, I don't like these roller coaster movies. I want things to be kind of mm -hmm. really slow. In fact, there was so much fighting in this. Like it seemed like it was so much of just giant armies coming over hills, shoot, you know, blowing each other up. <laughs> that I almost immediately stopped Robert caring. It's sort of man. like Lord of the Rings. As soon as like, um, I don't know, as soon whoa, as there's ten thousand orcs or whatever, I stop whoa. caring because nothing means <laughs> well, anything. Yeah, but that's that's a great example of, of I think a, a good cinematic adaption, and that, that's why I think the, doing the race at the start was so smart, replacing. Or for, when I say smart, I guess I should say uh, it was smart to make a movie that would succeed because and and vice versa. If you had done the race in the book, it would have been terrible. Uh, and mm -hmm. and the reason is like like so if the the race was great, like so that you're talking about visual spectacle on on the movie screen, seeing that is amazing. Like you're drawn in, you're seeing all this cool stuff going on. If you were to write that. It would be like, uh, okay, King Kong showed accelerated, up. and then he and then he turned his car left, and then a wrecking ball came down. And he turned his car right, and, the Kong, and there was a and he right, him, like, right. like it's completely just not interesting reading at all. Whereas in the book, where he went into, you know, he figured out that that the actual first challenge was on the school world, and it was a repeat of this old Dungeons and Dragons manual. Like there was discovery there, there was introspection because you could do that from a first person perspective. Uh, but in the movie, that probably would have fallen flat because it would have taken so long, and you wouldn't have had the look inside Wade's head that you get in the book. So yeah, I, I thought that was a like, joust. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But playing I'll... playing joust against a lich like that was great in the <laughs> book. Was, but yeah. in the movie, yeah. can you imagine that in the movie? Imagine imagine Wade <laughs> sitting there at an arcade console 
and there's a lich. <laughs> like, how do you even frame the camera, right? How do you, because they're both there. How do you even see the screen? You see the little, the little ostrich is like, boop, 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 boop. Like, how do you even, you know, film that? It doesn't work. It doesn't work in, in the cinema. Whereas the race works great, but the race would be terrible as a book. So I completely agree with all of that. And, and even further going back to when you were saying, and then while well, watching that, uh, that battle, it was like, at a certain point, I just lost interest. Part of that is because <laughs> we didn't get a very good feeling for the stakes at play in the movie. And mm -hmm. in Lord of the Rings, I think it's great because, you know, oh my God, like Mordor is about to just pop and this is oh, what's yes. happening. <laughs> but in, in the movie, it's like we get one scene where Sorrento is like, uh, we estimate that we can fill up the, the visor space with 80% <laughs> of advertisements before yeah, we induce that Caesar. Like a comic thing. <laughs> that was exactly. and it was just mentioned that it was, it was comically evil <laughs> so when they're saying in the book in the movie hey we're gonna fight for the oasis are you with me what does fighting for the oasis mean as an audience yeah. if you haven't read the book you're not so sure you don't and microtransactions right. are mm -hmm. a huge problem that we deal with and they had such an opportunity to really kind of further that and that wouldn't have even been 30 more minutes they could have they could have done more with that mm -hmm. yeah. i think That's it's a good all point stuff, yeah i totally got that because I, I read the book but movie, all, readers, all stuff, movie viewers were not. Yeah, all mm -hmm. the stuff that I miss is the stuff that probably in the mainstream they wouldn't care. Like, it, it's all this little, you know, you know niche things. Yeah, so I can't complain. I, I just wanted my other version. Of, I want, I guess, the, the limited series or something. The mini series. The yeah, they need to make a miniseries. Yeah. I saw Agent anything else? Uh, with another comment. Oh. All right, sorry, I was just going to, to say that that's... I'm not sure that that's something that Spielberg would care about or a feature as part of his thesis with the movie is I, I think why that's that's missing like he he the the movie feels thematically confused to me because Spielberg himself feels thematically confused and he's simultaneously <laughs> trying to deliver I think a message about this you know income disparity and a corporate machine while simultaneously I mean, like he's a huge institution he makes Hollywood blockbuster uh like spectacles that's that's a that's its own corporate machine like he he is serrano <laughs> but he's simultaneously <laughs> wade as as this idealist that doesn't want to like i don't know see that about his his work in his industry it's it's weird sorry that is i i find it interesting to, to look at it also as a psych profile of like the the, the director from the the auteur perspective hmm. Yeah, Can I you imagine the number of lawyers right. involved <laughs> and just getting all those, all those, all the rights to use all those IPs? Like, right, just and, talking and about and the corporate man. machinery, yeah. right? The, the, the number, the, yeah, the amount of, of corporate totally, machinations yeah. that must have gone into getting, you know, Ryu and Laura Croft and Tracer and, you know, Master Chief all on the screen at the same time. Uh, not to mention the movie like, references, which are even harder. I, when yeah, all those I mean, references I were flying I by, I didn't eggs. care. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, I so love that, it. yeah. that's what I thought the movie did well is because, so again, it's it's visuals, right? So if I don't know who Master Chief is, I just see, hey, there's a bunch of cool space marines charging up a hill. Okay, that's kind of neat. If I know who Master Chief is, I'm saying, oh, it's Master Chief. You know, it works <laughs> either way. Whereas mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that was a problem with the book because the book was uh, was a not a visual medium. That's one of the most common complaints I hear is people say, oh, yeah, Klein will just go on and give all these references. It's just a page of references with no context. And that's a valid critique to a point because if you don't know when he mentions his Robotron, if you don't know what Robotron is, you have no idea. With Master Chief in the movie, you have no idea who Master Chief is, but you're seeing him, and you're like, okay, that guy's kind of cool, you know? I, it's interesting, because mm -hmm. as they're flying by, like, I don't care that much. It's interesting that it does it for you. The one that I did but care it doesn't, about, like... it I, doesn't bother you, though, right? It doesn't bug it you, doesn't, you don't know. It doesn't bug me, but what I want is to spend some more time in some of the references. And, and so the, another big change from the book was The Shining, and I think that was actually yeah. my favorite part when they actually go mm -hmm. fully submerged into one piece of intellectual property, right? Like we got to actually sit in one movie. We, it was maybe there for like five or 10 minutes. It wasn't that long, but like, well, there's only one thing going on. I think that was my favorite H part. Was and that was my favorite that segment. <laughs> oh, yeah. I hate scary movies. Great. They're so good. <laughs> but to actually see something and to, to fall back and like, oh, this looks like the movie. Like I'm actually recreating the same shot in the movie. And now I feel like I'm there. Like that was really successful. As, in, I read today that was all games, virtual right? too. They virtually re yeah, they virtually yeah. recreated this the set. It was not it was not physical. They actually oh, they, they did actually took shots in there. Yeah. That was amazing. Yep.
Yeah, they used um, some. They used some shots where they could, like where they had footage, but a lot of it they actually recreated digitally. I wonder how upset Stanley Kubrick would be if he if he saw this, Ooh, like if it would bother him. <laughs> it's me, Matt. Yeah, me Matt. Point, Steven Spielberg and Kubrick were kind of like friends, so it, it kind of makes sense that it's like that. I think um, Spielberg did do this movie because at one point when Kubrick was still alive, they were kind of like buddies. That's what the um, that's why the movie, you know, the movie AI. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. supposed to be a Kubrick movie, yeah, right? Yeah, they, they, yeah, yes. but then mm-hmm. Kubrick died, and then the, they, uh, they were like Kubrick and um, Stan and um, the Kubrick and Spielberg were like passing the scripts back and forth between each other, and then Kubrick died, and then Spielberg made the movie, and not everybody. Not, mm-hmm. I would love to have seen the Kubrick version of AI, man. That would have been really cool i, I like <laughs> ai the spielberg version oh, but yeah. i think kubrick yeah. I, I would I've love heard... to see the kubrick version of ready player one <laughs> hey um we're, we're, okay ghoster can you do can you just do a pan across the audience I, I actually really like this setup the idea of us standing here with everybody sitting like this just this is just cool because it actually feels yeah. like <laughs> hi like... mom <laughs> hey, sorry, sitting on the table, me, I think. yeah it's just I like everybody's be. everybody's chilling around it's like it it, it actually works really well is, is there any myself. other changes from the book that you want to talk about? Anything that they've completely... Uh, yeah, I want to talk about Artemis. Know. I definitely want to mention that. And I'm sure Xerxes mm. will have some thoughts as oh, well. Geez. So what that's... The way Artemis is presented is one of the biggest complaints of the book. And I think it's it's a valid complaint. Uh, I mean, I understand why uh, she, she basically... So uh, basically in, in the book, uh, many people uh, reward the book and say Artemis comes off as kind of a one-dimensional character who's just a trophy. Uh, which I think actually is, I don't think that was Klein's intent, but I think it definitely is looking at it now, a valid critique of the book. And that, and I think it's because of the way it's framed. So in the book, you know, he, it's all from Wade's perspective because it is told from his POV. So we don't get in and we don't see it, any of what Artemis is doing, uh, which we do in the movie. Uh, and Wade basically does everything. Like Artemis is doing some stuff and you kind of, but you never see that. It's all, it's all Wade doing all things. And at the end, literally his reward, he saved the Oasis, He's, you know, he, he's, he's inherited it and, and he gets to meet Artemis for the first time. And he's like, oh, great. It's Artemis. She's my girlfriend now. Like, she's a trophy. She's not a person in, in that sense. Uh, I understand that again, complaint, but doesn't that make yeah. sense for the nostalgia factor? Like, that's how all those 80 movies ended. Like, it's well, so awful. Here's the thing. <laughs> that's the way we treat women, but. Well, going, but it's not nostalgia. It's going back to the idea that the book was written for a particular subset, right? It, and, I, I, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the young young male fantasy of i am really good at pulp culture i win you know the contest and i get the hot girlfriend like that appeals to the young the male or you know anyone who i guess if you're into girls doesn't matter male or female but it hits that that particular demographic where when i compared it to twilight again twilight had something that that fit a very particular demographic where say a 30 Mm. or 40 year old man may very well enjoy twilight and that's absolutely fine but it wasn't targeted to that demographic. And the book was targeted to that particular demographic, uh, which is why with a lot of people, it fell flat. Now in the movie, what they did really well is, that, well, they did a couple of things. First of all, Wade did not do any stalkery stuff, which again, <laughs> that's another product of the eighties where, you know, it, I think it, I, hopefully everyone would agree nowadays that if you're, you know, if you're kind of hanging out with a chick and she tells you flat out, like, look, it, it was nice, but I, I don't want to date anymore. I don't want you to contact me. And then you're standing out front in her lawn holding a boombox, right? At the time, that was cool. But nowadays, mm. that's kind of creepy. It's like, I told you I don't want anything to do with you, dude. Why are you standing in front of my lawn sending me messages? And there was a lot of, you know, Par- Parzival, you know, was contacting her constantly. Hey, can we, can we get together? You know, Artemis is kind of like, no, I don't want to do that. It's like, oh, well, you know what? Well, what are you going to block me, et cetera? And in the movie, they really solved a lot of that. They actually made Artemis the instigator in a lot of their flirting. Like Wade wasn't flirting with her. She was mm. flirting with him. She was leading, not leading him on, but she was in her, she had fun. She's like, she's teasing him. She's joking with him. She actually seems actually interested in him. So it's a mutual thing as opposed to seeing it from Wade's perspective in the book where it feels mm. one-sided. I don't think Klein intended it to be that way. I think in his mind, Artemis was reciprocating the feelings and was just holding back because of the contest, but that's not clear from the book at all. So, and, but, but, so that was a, a, a huge improvement in the movie is, is their relationship, even though it's still, as you said, two dimensional to an extent as mm. it is in any spectacle, but it was still far better. Well, I still think, I still think it falls into the same trap because even if she is the instigator, it, 
it doesn't quite make sense because she has an entire time when she's like, you don't know me, you don't know who I am. She, do she doesn't know anything about him either. So it mm -hmm. still is kind of that fantasy of, yeah, she's in love with me because I am first to the key or something like that. And in, in the movie too, I mean, I know they had the dancing scene and everything, but but when he they meet in real life and then he like strokes her neck up to her chin, I just like, I'm like <laughs> freaking out in the theater. I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that, was, little, was, that awful. was a little awkward question. Like, oh, it's nice to meet you. Oh, hey. Who would do that? You know, so. But it is so, interesting yes, because I, so it asks the perhaps question. Perhaps the critique is less. It was less stalkery in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it does ask the question is how are we able to kind of really get across the idea that when we're acting in VR, it is feeling like real life and they were dancing and they were very close. And is it possible that that was just the movie's failure to make the chemistry apparent of what can happen in virtual reality? That's the question I have. They did make it apparent because remember he got that um, the suit that made you like, like the touch sense of the suit. <laughs> it made you ask it. Yeah, but it's all very I accelerated. Think. Quick question <laughs> yeah, for, for the yeah. guys here. Uh, who, who, raise your hand if you would buy a suit that simulates being kicked in the balls. Oh, no. That didn't yeah. make any sense. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. Yes. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> raising, no guys are raising their hands. Yes, I <laughs> You would? Wait, Rupert, You'll take then, it. Uh, uh, raise your hand so I can't tell if you have your, your hand up. But Rupert, go ahead. And not the only thing that it does. Yeah, so, like, you want full fidelity. That's that's how far you go. Is it just like is it just the crotch plate? Is that it? Because <laughs> I only my ball is getting let's, 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 ah. Wait, Chair get over here, Wow, get, get the wait, questions. Wait, wait Rubik, I can't hear you. You're not muted, are you? No, no. Uh, in terms of differences, I feel like there was re some really good ones. For example, the fact that in the book it felt like. Um, Anonymous had to prove that she was geeky enough or knowledgeable enough, whereas in the movie it was uh, possible had for like the scene in H he was H himself garage he had to answer the questions and then in the rest of the movie I think for the second key she was explaining him stuff like she was mm. teaching him stuff she was you know the main uh, character in that lead I mean the the quest mm. uh, also. Um, we talk about the fact that they don't know each other, don't really know anything, but she's the one telling him, you can't tell me your name. It's the, it's VR, like it's not the real world, it's scary, it's dangerous. We shouldn't share real information. So in, in some way they flirt and they, you know, make that relationship because they can't do anything else. They can't share any information. That's as far as they can go already. It's the interaction they have in VR. So. It actually, it's, I don't know, it fits perfectly in the theme and the fact that it's dangerous and that it's going to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, we're, I do want to head towards hamster, the last section. Uh, yeah, let's say hamster go and then we'll... Uh, hamster, oh, if you're talking, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Are you muted? I don't have any, nothing else there to say. Yeah, we hear you now. Good. Oh, we're good? We're good. Yes, Ghoster. Yeah, let's get let's get Hamster's comment and then and then yours, right? No, I was just raising my hand for the uh, the suit where I can I can feel. Oh, okay, you're another <laughs> you're another. <laughs> the ball ball okay, yes, simulate fine. the ball the ball kicking simulator. Okay, well, I want, I want want full simulation. Balls. Well, yes, there could be full <laughs> simulation, but there are there are probably the limits like. Happen. <laughs> yes, you can generate sensations down there, but not to the point of generating being kicked in the balls. Like, who signs up for that? Sorry. Anyway. Moving on. It's just a movie, Lau. <laughs> Sorry, Coaster. Oh, yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that was my yeah. favorite thing about the movie, though, is, is they gave, like I said, Wade doing everything. Artemis was the one who chose to stay. She had the chance in the movie. She had the chance to escape IOI. She put herself at risk, stayed, and she was the key to everything. She was the one who took down the shield. She was the one who got them in. She, she had this tremendously heroic act where she got to be such an integral and, and, and key part of the final scene, the final battle. In the book, that was not the case. Wade did everything. Wade was the one who both saved everyone and went to ioi so i love that they gave artemis that role and allowed her to do much more in the movie mm. yeah. i think um... hmm. 
right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you brought up like uh the, the fame aspect of it. In in the movie we get like one scene of a piece of newspaper clipping that says that the credit, the Oasis credit is now the most uh the biggest currency in the world. Whereas mm -hmm. we didn't we didn't have much exploration like those were the things that I really miss from this movie are the technical aspects of the Oasis and how it uh interacts yeah. with society. Mhm. Mm I think um, uh, the, a major thing, if I may, um, about the book and the movie that's like, I feel like one of the biggest problems of the movie for me is like the pacing, right? Um, I, I think one thing that they skipped that they shouldn't have is uh, to make it more clear how long everything took to happen. And even though that seems simple, I think that would have made the, mo uh, the movie uh, give it more depth because um, in the movie, it seemed like everything happened in like a week or, you know, a couple of days. So it seemed like it was just another game, you know, they just did a bunch of stuff. But, you know, in the book, they, they had all this stuff over a span of time. You know, um, they fell in love, for instance, over a span of months, almost a whole year. And so, but in the book, I mean, in the movie, it was like, it seemed like it was like a couple of days. So it was like, oh, I'm in love with you. And he's like, what? You, you just met her. So um, mm. that, and then with the conflict, when, when, they, when she went to IOI, that seemed like, like it was just easy for her to just get in and get out. <laughs> Rather than in the book, it took months. Um, even if they switched it to Artemis, they could have done better with having some type of, you know, ex a, a sample of how hard it was to actually, you know, make that happen over a span of time, um, including with it, it just, just, just a lot of different of the uh, different pieces of the conflict that they should have um, used some type of, you know, um, uh, time aspect to it to show and give it more depth um, to show how it affects the world. That would have shown more about, you know, what other people use it for. That would have shown. More about the importance of the uh, of oasis and all that stuff. So I completed a Westwatch in a uh, day. In 30 <laughs> yeah, it is, it is the Westworld like teleporting problem where like it's just something yeah. like the storytelling has to keep accelerating and you know one scene somebody's here, the next scene they're all the way across the planet. It doesn't matter. Yep, um, everyone's yeah, involved. Like the genre, yeah. it's the two-hour movie. So yeah. So mm. we need more time, Spielberg. Next time you have to give us more <laughs> time. Um, Six-hour okay. miniseries, perfect. <laughs> So this is set Entire 30 season. years from now. Let, let's talk about how realistic this is. Is this where we're going? And is this what we want to happen? So I have, no. I have some bullet points about what I got right and wrong. I'll try to be quick because I want to let Xerxes and, 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 you, and other people offer thoughts. So the yeah, things that, that I think it definitely gets right is, is IP violation everywhere. Like VRChat proves that. Like, <laughs> like it's just whatever, you know. Uh, it, 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 obviously not everyone is using models that they've ripped from other games, but most people are. It's just kind of normal. We expect that. Um, also, the fact that, you know, people are actually doing, uh, people are in VR all the time. Like, again, talking about that earlier, I think that's totally plausible. I think, based on my own experiences, like, the thing holding people back from mainstream VR adoption right now is the clunkiness of the headsets, the barrier to entry with needing a fast computer, with the setup, with the lighthouse, even the inside out. There's all these barriers. Yeah, and Ready Player One, it's basically a Gear VR that's more powerful than like any VR headset we have. You literally put this thing on, boop, you're done, and everything is, is fully immersive. So when it gets to that point and it is photorealistic, which I think is absolutely possible in 30 years, and in fact much quicker, mm -hmm. then it starts to hit that mainstream point. It becomes as popular as TV and everyone's doing it. So I think that's absolutely accurate. We, we mentioned a little earlier, we were talking in the lobby about the fact that there's, no, there, there's nothing in there about moderation like there's no explanation mm. as to who's creating the content. We were talking about the fact that it's almost likely user created because that's how VR chat works, right? No, mm -hmm. no company, you could have a company with 10,000 employees and they still would not be able to produce content at a rate that would be sufficient to keep, you know, the entire population of the world entertained. It's not possible. So that's already it's just true like VR any, chat. Yes, but VR Chat doesn't have to create the content. VR Chat provides the platform, and everyone in here, well, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of creators in here, has made avatars for people, has made worlds for people, and the, the content is made for free. You, you guys aren't paid, right? None of us were paid to make our worlds for VR Chat. We just did it because we wanted to share it. So that's a model that could certainly be what they meant in the movie, but they never explain it. So I, that that was something where I felt it wasn't necessarily realistic because they they pitched it I think as yeah Halliday and 
Og created, and maybe their small team created the entire Oasis. N no effing way. Like, that's not possible. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, you know, mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump back one second because you just mentioned Halliday and we haven't talked about him. And this is just going back to the movie. I loved his portrayal in the movie, man. I think that was all. He was my favorite character. Every that time we're with Halliday, yeah. I, I, I like the improvement. Really yeah. impressed. Anorak's mm -hmm. like yeah. Avatar. Like my name is Xerxes the Wise because like that entire image I love so much. Like this Dungeons and Dragons guy in his age. He's he's kind of you know very socially awkward, uh, possibly somewhere on the spectrum. That's kind of the the gist that I got from. It, but when he turned into Anorak, it was like his inner image bursted out of him. And oh no, I just pressed a button. Um, okay, I'm back. Uh, Don't press that button again. Okay, that's a death button. Don't and press like the, the voxels on his robe and everything. <laughs> I just I loved it too. It was it was amazing. That is like a nice way to subtly like I was complaining about missing the school and all the other special things that VR is giving us. But like that's a subtle thing of this character who is very like. Yeah, antisocial or whatever, but you see him transform from the real world into mm. the game. Like that's a nice subtle way of getting that in there. And that feels very mm. real to VR chat. We've had that discussion in Endgame a number of times where a lot of people who have who have had discussions here have said, you know, for whatever reason they're not comfortable, they're not fully comfortable in real life, they're not comfortable socially, but they come into VR chat and all of a sudden they can be they can be social, they can feel comfortable and and, and have friends and get to know people. You know, which which again is a tremendously positive experience. Uh, it can be. Obviously, there's lots of negative aspects as well, but that's a very positive uh, element of VR. You know, that, that that would lead me into the response of the question that you asked of, you know, where do we see ourselves in 30 years? Uh, my entire podcast is, is about this, so I'll try and keep this as short and, and concise as possible. But I have this weird, optimistic, like utopian view that VR has the potential to completely get us out of a type of materialistic mindset, right? When we are able mm. to craft anything within our hands at a moment's notice, we'll sudden, and we're seeing this mo with millennials right now. You can see studies that say, why are millennials not using their money at restaurants? They're, they're going to concerts and they're doing this. Well, Crushing student loans. Crushing student loans. <laughs> that, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, but there's, covers that one. <laughs> also, there yeah, tends to be experiences, experience. right? There tends oh, to be this Lord. idea that ex <laughs> <laughs> that experiences are being valued more than a car. Uh, being with your mm. friends and being with your family, we're starting to see this kind of cultural shift, I think. And I think VR is entering into re uh, existence at the perfect point time and sometimes i have to try and stop myself because i feel like a lunatic talking about this but i i have this image that something like ioi won't exist in the future because you're no longer going to even when you can explore any world you want to why are you going to mm -hmm. go and sit down at a desk and try and get 300 dollars out of someone for not you know paying for their 50 gigabytes it's soul crushing mm -hmm. it's draining yep. why wouldn't you just put on your headset and go experience something and I, I hope to see that in 30 years, something like the Oasis happens because people begin to create the virtual existence that they want to be in. Mm -hmm. And and that's going to be a topic that we see asked and talked about more and more is what kind of lifestyle do we want to have and, and what can we afford to have? Yeah, I want to add quickly to that. And then it, we have a lot of questions, so I want to get to that. But yes, I 100% I, I agree with you. And I think what it comes down to is most of human nature where humans are in conflict and we make the world crappy for each other is due to conflict over resources. I eat or you eat. You know, I have a house, you have a house. I have money, you have money. Once virtual reality becomes acceptable where I can be in a virtual world and it's just as satisfying as the real, it's it's like the ebook thing, right? Like, there's no limit on how many ebooks can be given, even though we charge a lot for them. Uh, it's it's virtual. It's it's unlimited resources. So people chase that right now. They're like, oh, fusion power. Like we get fusion, we'll have you know such a, such a great thing, and it'll help because there's not as much competition. VR could be that, because if mm. I can be satisfied in VR and have all my emotional and physical needs met, it, there's no limit on that. Obviously, somebody might try to put a limit on it, but functionally, everyone now has unlimited resources to have whatever they like. You don't Which need that again, new your, yacht your or that luxury mansion. Yeah. I'm like, I do mm -hmm. wonder, like, in a, in a world like World of Warcraft, uh, scarcity was made also, and it was enjoyable. Like, I ran the auction house, and, and I was trying to outcompete with this and this, but it was all kind of virtual money at the end of the day. So I do think that it may continue in some form like that. I, I, I'm wondering if we can draw parallels from the virtual worlds we have now to the virtual worlds we'll have in 30 years. 
Yeah. We had a, we, I think we had a number of questions around that. What yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go ahead and, yeah. Uh, we'll start on this way. I, I thought so Dave. Dave had his hands up a couple of times, actually. Dave hasn't said Okay, anything. go ahead. All right, so I've slowly lost my train of thought the entire thing, but before I begin, <laughs> first off, this tastes like garbage. This apple juice is improvement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, you're paying for that. But anyway, <laughs> the moral of the story is that I don't think that something like the Oasis should ever come to pass. And before you all get Ooh. your panties in a knot, hold on. <laughs> the thing is, is that there is something about the real world button. that needs to be said. So the thing is, is that Earth, it's our planet. And whether we like it or not, it contains the most, it, it's literally everything we have. Everything we have as a society, as a planetoid, as just us in humanity in general is defined by everything we observe from nature around us. But yeah. moreover than that, we need to remember that it is our job to just to, not only to take care of it, but it is our job to make something of ourselves in the world. Many people do this in very different ways, by do, for example, doing fine craftsmanship, for example, going ahead and building a home, going ahead and starting their own business, as becoming a head of a corporate empire that has plans to take over the oasis, but that's for another day. <laughs> the moral of the story is, is that making something of yourself in real life is going to be much more fulfilling in VR, because when you take off the headset, it doesn't go away. What you built is what's yours. If someone were to unplug the server that this ho the server is on, or th that this map is on, we would all disappear. If someone were to erase each one of our hard drives, or if someone were to drop a nuke on the United States, or wherever you all are broadcasting from, with th all this data is gone. But at the end of the day, things you can build with your own two hands, things you can go ahead and create with your mind, they, they might be tougher to make. They may require tools. They require craftsmanship. They require skill. But at the end of the day, they don't break easily. They are works of art that you now have these skills to make and moreover than anything else. But I, don't think you your... I don't think those are incompatible, though, the idea of making yeah. something of yourself and being virtual. Like, I have seen exactly. avatars. I've seen avatars in worlds in VR chat that just blow me away. Just the artistry involved, the technical skill. Mm. You know, you talk about building things. Like, yes, building a physical house is nice, but I've seen somebody build a world where I'm just looking at this and like, this is so incredible. Like, how did they even Some think Minecraft of this? Minecraft worlds are incredible. Yeah, Minecraft I mean, there's, there's all sorts yeah. of stuff. So, but I, I think you've got a point about, you know, you, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna ever get to the point where we're not taking care of the planet. But I think in a way, if, if we're no longer like if I no longer have to burn, you know, gas to get to and from work, if I no longer have to, you know, purchase all of this material stuff that requires, you know, sweatshop laborers in China or whatever, there's all of these consumerist things that we do to kind of try to make ourselves content. And if that goes away, maybe we aren't consuming the planet's resources as extensively as we are now. Maybe we aren't, you know, pulling down all this stuff. So I, I don't disagree with you necessarily, but I don't think your idea and the idea of virtual reality are incompatible. I think you yeah. could actually have mm -hmm. those 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 goals could be met in VR to some extent. And a small thing to add on too. If I can interject here, does, quick. does anyone remember? Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Um, so actually, all about that. Um, I run a server uh, on Discord, all about avatar making and stuff. And we're recently doing an interview process with all of our server members, and I can tell you, there are some amazing people who do such highly technical work, like full three-minute song animations with that literally change and shape the world around them. Um, even to the point I've told mm. people I've become numb to the fact that stuff is cool. I've just seen so much cool stuff <laughs> that literally everything has become boring. So, yeah, there is there are some crazy people, and it could be even as simple as um, I was talking with an animator once, and he said, yeah, look at the spinning gun animation. I don't know why people love it, but it's so, like, people love it, because it's just mm. a spinning gun, and Literally 10 minutes later, we're still talking. He pulls out the spinning gun animation. And he draws a crowd. And, and, and it's like, see, that's what we <laughs> want to go for. You know, something like that. But mm. the artistry in this world, I think, also does transfer out. Like, like uh, mm -hmm. Lousy, you know how you built the, the, the Dark Star, the White Snake, and some other world. I can't remember right. which it was. I know those. Like, I could literally, like, mm. go, if I could go to them, I would. Or how Owlboy built the Great Pug off of a real bar called the Great Dane. You know, where'd he go? He was here earlier. <laughs> no. But like everybody knows the Great Pug. Everybody, <laughs> you like, you go to worlds and you know the people who make them, or you go, you follow people and you get to know them. And I think that is part of it. Is 
yes, there's artistry that you can make with physical stuff, but also the fact that the knowledge and the friendships that you make here are probably going to transcend any materialistic good that we're having. And that actually also goes back to the millennial point as well is we want experiences. Mm -hmm. We don't want materials anymore. We want to have a good time. We want to make memories. We want to remember it all. AKA the nineties kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that there's a lot of people who are still wanting to add in something, but I just wanted to butt in real quick and kind of say, you brought up the word fulfillment. And that is a huge thing that I focus on. Um, I know that myself, I felt pretty fulfilled with my avatar in World of Warcraft. And I look back on those times with a lot of nostalgia. And a, like I, there were obstacles and hours and hours of turmoil and trials. And I remember seeing people selling their high-level tunes for a lot of money. And mm -hmm. I, I think that fulfillment can be simulated. Maslow's hierarchy, shelter, food, friends, uh, a sense of accomplishment, that can be simulated. I, I don't think it has to be the real world. And there are, and if everyone has to reach that, that kind of self-fulfillment, 7 billion people can't do that on this planet. It, there's just there's not enough room. And growing. So if we can simulate that, and, and I, I don't know, I just don't want there to be a stigma around virtual experience if it's good enough to be like the real thing anyways mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh i don't mm -hmm. know who is next but shadow yeah all right well, i'll keep it short because i can go on all day um just xerxes we definitely have to talk after this because i've dropped this several times but i'm all about creating that that next thing um that you know the world will go into because i believe you know either, whether it be the oasis or whatever else i believe that would be the the most important thing to do for Emani right now, but in in in, in essence, um, the Oasis itself, I think, um, has a one major flaw in that the the microtransactions of travel is utterly ridiculous. So when we do create yes. the next thing in thirty years, That's however ridiculous. that that works, it shouldn't have any sort of <laughs> transaction fees for for traveling. First and foremost, nope. mm. and then um, secondly, 100%, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think it is possible to do that in 30 years because right now it's good. It's, it's already basically possible in 10 years, right? Um, virtual reality, I've always said this, is going to be a long run. It's going to be a low, a, a slow burn, right? Um, everybody's counting, counting the, the the metrics for virtual reality right now, but it's not important right now. Right now, it's just a foundation. It's just the the the, the sparks, right? Augmented reality is going to be what's most important right now. Why? Because it, it's it's going to show how you can actually, um, to uh, Dave's point, it's going to show how you can fuse the virtual world with the real world, right? Um, mm. We talked about fulfillment and all this stuff. So when you create virtual things, it has an impact on the real world because it's still part of the real world. It's the, it's the, it's the, uh, the focus of ideas, right? It's the little manifestation of ideas so like facebook right now you know it's it's not physical it's it's completely virtual if they pl un you unplug the service it's gone but you can't unplug the service because they're everywhere <laughs> they're a part of the world so like <laughs> facebook has changed the world so much that it's literally a part of the world now so i think the same thing is for virtual reality so in the next couple of years augmented reality is going to be important because it fuses that virtual with the real and then virtual um reality is going to be um incredibly important because it's going to be the kind of like ascension of the world it's going to allow everybody um to create their dreams and to live the fulfilled lives in a virtual you know uh, uh, existence that still impacts the world through augmented and mixed reality and stuff like that so shadow do you think that augmented reality has the potential to bring social aspects like i i'm not quite aware of all of the uses for augmented reality but i think mm -hmm. that vr takes off when it becomes truly social, it is AR going to go oh, yeah, through something certainly. like that. Mm. AR uh, to me is more focused on um, how to read the real world, how to understand all that data coming through. Um, so mm. it impacts uh, social um, uh, communication in the way that you can actually look at somebody and then uh, get an understanding of their story of whatever they want to tell about themselves, whether it be like a virtual skin of themselves that should, that overlays with their real, um, you know, clothes or it, it's their metrics or whatever they want to uh, share themselves, like their stacks or whatever, or it, even if it's their, their networking, you know, and business um, aspects all overlaid over their person that you literally see through augmented reality, right? That, that becomes That's a, great example, yeah. a new, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it becomes a new overlay over your reality. It becomes a new reality. And so yeah. that impacts your social, um, you know, aspects as well. 
there's a there's a show called uh, Psychopaths, which is one of my favorite animes ever, and it has a lot of dystopian themes. But actually, what you just mentioned, I thought, is a great theme that it has but doesn't talk about. Uh, is everyone in in the psychopath world? They all wear very basic, just just garb. It's just completely plain and doesn't really have any features. But they use essentially AR to make themselves look like they're wearing whatever clothes they have. And if you look at you know, going back to school, right? We we're talking about people who are bullied in school. Often a trigger for people being bullied is if they're poor, right? They're poor, they can't afford the same type of clothes as their wealthier friends. They, they are, that makes them a target and they're stigmatized. And that's an element of consumerism, right? You, if you have the money or you don't. In an in AR, as an example, if everybody wears the same clothes and you can make them look like whatever you want and it's free because it's virtual, that's again you've eliminated a, a big element of consumerism and now everybody can be equal essentially without anyone taking from anyone else which i think is key yeah. we don't have to compete because Our the resource is unlimited as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure exactly. whole, whole yeah. environment dave that's seems wild. really desperate to to to, to like, add something too like an, <laughs> wasn't there an arc in psychopath thank you for being patient dave mm -hmm. sorry i, I I don't know. Do we do we want to do we want to see what what Dave had to say because he's had his hand up for a while since we oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Lyco like, like too has also <laughs> been <laughs> one to speak. Yeah. Sorry. Go I ahead, think David. in I think in this entire thing we're underestimating the value of like real physical things, especially because once the digital illusion is up, once the servers are defeated by an EMP or salt water or someone tears the headset off of your face, everything that you built in the <laughs> digital world is gone. And that's oh, not you... to say that we phenomenal things can't be built digitally but if i were to go ahead and put time and effort into creating many of the modern inventions that make vr possible i think the one thing that we're forgetting here is that there were plenty of inventions by people who had to go ahead and make real things in order to achieve what they wanted to i don't think we're disagreeing though i don't i don't think we're no. arguing yeah i don't think we're arguing that you give up on real world stuff I, I think, oh, no. I think, like, I certainly agree that we still need to take care of the real world and accomplish things in the real world. I just think, at least what mm -hmm. I'm saying, is yes, we should continue to do that, but part of the reason the real world sucks for so many people is because there are not enough resources. You can be as hardworking and determined to make your way in this world as you want in the real world, but if you're held back due to being born poor, due to being born in an impoverished country, due to being born somewhere, there are constraints that you cannot come over because of the competition for resources. So yes, we need to take, mm -hmm. take care of the real world, but make it virtual, give people virtual equality almost, and a lot of those problems go away. So no, I don't Mona, think we're disagreeing. Were uh, we're, we're not saying we're not saying neglect the real world, but I think we're saying take care of the real world and have virtual reality almost be like the unlimited An resource enhancer. that makes the real world better. An enhancer, that's great. Yeah, I uh, absolutely I'm, think that it has the ability to enhance real life, especially if we start working in virtual offices. We don't have to go to work. Then when we leave the that's house, it can actually chat. been. Everybody yeah, it can actually be for our virtually. own reason. Like, I'm going to go to that <laughs> park. I'm not going to go outside of my house to go to work. But no, I'm going to go and do that thing. I think it can actually free us up to experience real life in ways that we haven't before. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Go to real life to hang out with your kid as opposed to going real life to work nine hours at a grindy job or ten hours to, to feed your kid. Right? How, how different would that be? Spend ten and hours with your kid rather than spending ten hours earning trouble. money to get them a ramen packet. Yeah. If an yeah, EMP falls, we are already yeah. going to face a doomsday scenario because our entire lives are already digital, whether we like it or not. Yeah, it's to that point. <laughs> yeah. If you build a house, nephew, and, and it's this beautiful house and it's real, it can still be taken out by a superstorm or whatever. And if, yeah. and if you scan it with photogrammetry, that scan is going to live on past the, the real house. So there you go. I scan your loved ones. Hard drive with salt water. <laughs> I, I don't think he's wrong. I think we're, I think we're coming at it. No, no, you're not wrong. Everyone's yeah. making terrific points. I'm just, I want to move along. The chair's keep over beating me. I can't, I can't stop oh. it. We had some thoughts on it. Who was, who was next? Did you have any idea? Like, was it? Lyco. I was thought I saw some, some hands or comments over here. So I want to oh, make let's sure. Oh, let's go Lyco, because Lyco, you haven't said anything yet. Sorry. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh my gosh, are we going to hear you? Oh, I hear something. I was originally asking that, I like the idea, how would people would think, VR seriously when it comes to avatars. Like, in the state of right now, people are just favoring meme, meme stuff and funny stuff. It's like, we, I couldn't even, even I wouldn't take it seriously. How would you make VR be taken seriously as, as to how?
so that it could be at least be be I think, suitable for oh. everyone to be, to be suitable for everyone to use. Like just I can't I can't easy. hear very well. Did you guys hear the question? Oh. Yeah, he's yeah, saying, uh, um, how can you make you uh, VR serious? Yeah, because uh, there's no current way to easily make VR avatars. So how, how what kind of software no, or, or you know technology can we use to make that more serious? Yeah, yeah. Like, when I watched yeah. Ready Player One, I didn't know how did that guy was able to convince millions of people, millions of people on on buying the headset, like, wow, and then being in a cat, being in a character. Sometimes people want to just be be themselves, especially in social media. So I don't know how how you, can you reach that ambition of. We've already done that though. There's actually yeah. There's 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 avatar creators out there already. Like there's there's morph. Obviously, Ready Room is one. They made one for and those those are those are advancing right now. But yeah, but but um. So look at any MMORPG, right? Uh, World of Warcraft, perfect example. Everybody who played World of Warcraft, most of them did not know how to 3D model, but the cu character customizer that was given to them as part of World of Warcraft was had enough features that they could feel like they created an avatar that was specific to them. So I think, again, Facebook is already doing this. I think Facebook Spaces is a perfect example where they actually have customization where it is designed to let you make a 3D avatar that represents you. Beard, you know, glasses, features, whatever. And that's primitive, but it's going to get more advanced. And so, yeah, within 10 years, I can see a VR character it creator. Really if VR is mainstream, if you want to be in there, it's going to be simple enough that you get on and like, oh, I'm just going to recreate myself in VR using sliders and using selections with no mm -hmm. 3D modeling required. And it's just all yeah. going to work. And, yeah. So, in the bigger picture... Yeah, like, in the bigger picture, they will take it seriously because, you know, it's actually used for more than just gaming and, and more than just, you know, just sitting around talking. Um, VR, yeah. like, that's, that's the problem with the movie. They didn't really talk about the other stuff. In the book, um, they talk about how, like, um, normal was saying, Education. you can go to school, yeah. you can have a bunch of uses for VR. And, and as that happens, as the content happens, because I work at an arcade, so we're always looking for more content in that, in that vein. Um, the content is coming out. And as it does, um, comes out in different experiences and interactive uh, environments uh, allows you to go to Mars or, or you know, um, get educational experiences at a museum Mars. or art, or whatever. As more <laughs> of that content happens, <laughs> then you actually be able to uh, um, take it more seriously in, in, in the greater mainstream. Yeah, like Rubik, role-playing yeah, servers thought, in World right? of Warcraft. Rubik, yeah, Rubik I mean, had that over here. Yeah. First of all, I, wanna, I wanted to ask, like, oh, if he had a VR headset, because that's the question oh. you people have if they don't have VR. Mm -hmm. we, we, the I people who own VR, VR they, they are convinced. Right now. Like, okay, you own VR. Well, I have, right? No, currently, because I use a Mac. I use a Mac. Okay, and... but have you tried one? Uh, yeah, I tried one when I went to a gaming, a local gaming event. And then okay, and you weren't used... convinced when you tried it? Yeah, but the problem is that, of course, the prices are too steep. It's not compatible to my current OS. Okay, so it's just a uh, compatibility, mm -hmm. but not like yeah. impressing people. The barrier to entry uh, is still really high, like we like we, is, we mentioned. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it'll get easier. It's easier. At some point. It'll get easier. High. Yeah. It's still a hobby. Like if you want to get into golfing or mountain biking, it's really expensive as well. So like mm -hmm. we just I don't know. Keep. Uh, I mean, I, like I said, I, awesome I bought a Vive Pro. Like if uh, that's not a waste of money, I don't know what is. Like there's no reason to buy it. But <laughs> like, I mean, but it's so it was a luxury. <laughs> it's like it's a luxury. Vibe, like I spent uh, it because Vibe's VR. Gonna have support soon. The Vive is gonna have max support soon. So I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna. Be exactly. Be and Apple's coming so. out. <laughs> oh, are they? I have a question. Oh. I mean, oh more, yeah, Rubik. More of a point. That was um, up. actually, I need to. Think about it. Um, yeah, we keep wanting to have really good social VR and really good uh, um, metaverse and all that stuff. So, and at the same time, don't want any dystopian future. And I think these cannot are uh, completely mutually ex exclusive. Like you cannot have extremely overwhelming and satisfying uh, VR. And in the same on the same side, you know, have a world that functions really well. Because if you say enhance the real world, I don't understand that at all. 
Like it's it's like the beginning of the movie. So you're you saying can go VR mountain... would be better if the world sucks? It's like like yes, yeah, yeah it has to, it has to. There's no way. <laughs> like, I mean, no. you, you, at the beginning of the movie, it says you can go mountain climbing yeah, with that. I think that's true. Why the fuck would you go in the forest next to your house if you could go mountain climbing with Batman as if it actually yeah. looks real? Like there's no fucking way if people would choose real life over VR. And you talk, we talk about the millennial, uh, millennials all the time. Um, millennials would rather choose VR and a life of, you know, social interactions virtual because that's mostly what we have these days. The millennials are not going to get have kids. Like the next generation is not going to have kids. Honestly, Great. like it's going to be so it. it's going to be too, no, I mean, it's going to be too expensive. It's going to be difficult because the planet is going to be there's going to be short already, so, so, I mean, it's already yeah. is. Uh, and now yeah, you know there's going to be China. There's going to be Africa. There's going to be many countries of Asia that are going to go grow up and are going to have these technologies to escape because these countries are fucked completely fucked. So it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's a great so message. I, so everybody, don't don't try to make the world better. We want to make the world worse. No, so that it's VR, so that VR true. will be so much better for us. The baby, baby <laughs> yeah. of this generation is already ruined. It. I've like, been doing it all wrong. I've been trying to improve the world, when I should be trying to just because yeah, because then VR would be great. That's you're right. You're right. Yes. <laughs> what you're what you're talking about here is one of the answers to the Fermi paradox. We, uh, by all means, we should have yes. encountered alien life at We've some point that by before. now, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's you kind of that going nominal? inward. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so we have the theory. We have the theory that every 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 uh, uh, civilization that advances to the point where their technology could take them to the stars figures out VR, even Matrix style simulations, and just goes yeah. into themselves, just lives on their planet, and they're you know, virtual world, and that's why we've never encountered aliens, which I think is an really like, incredibly uh, funny thing. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> building an oasis. Everybody's like in a matrix. Right, yeah. right. Really hanging out, but um, in, in, in regards to his, I think that's actually opposite in the case that if the world is the worst place, VR would not really work because the technology would never progress to that point. That's the biggest problem with it. Like, it would be hmm, so bad. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't so have enough to get people bad, to create the content. Bad enough that we don't want to be there, create, yeah. but good enough that we have tech. So there's a balance. <laughs> I think that's part where we are. There's a drop-off moment where VR gets extremely good. <laughs> Starting the moment where VR is extremely good and compelling and everybody can, can get into it, then people start, you know, using VR and then the real world goes to shit. That's the drop-off. It's not like... Okay, that's the goal. It's not going to be right. slow. Well, so oh, that's what happened in the really book. Good. It's, yeah, but that's, that's also the question that I have because that's the question is, are we all going to just you know, let our room get messy, so to speak. Um, I um, honestly, I, I, <laughs> that's I, right. I, I need a minimum don't... square it's gonna be extremely clean. <laughs> for our omnidirectional treadmill. <laughs> I don't quite know the answer to it, but for some reason, I don't think that we're going to be in stacks. Like, well, one, we're getting autonomous cars. We're getting much better with solar technologies and batteries. I feel like there's going to be a place for both things. I, I also see what you're mm -hmm. saying. It's a, it's a question. W like, how is it going to happen? I don't think any of us really know, though. It does depend how close do we about, get you know, to we fully. Mm -hmm. mm. You got to yeah. find a sweet spot. Go you gotta get, like I said, you just got to get just bad enough that VR gets great, and then we pull back from that and then make the world better. <laughs> but we got to get to that. Did you want to add something? Oh, yeah, Fel, go ahead. No, go ahead, yeah. Are you muted? I don't think your mic's turned on. Okay, um, yeah. okay. Oh. So. We've been talking about like whether um we should really take care of like, the real after we see that the virtual becomes so much better. But let's see like what's the minimum physical things you need to keep like a VR presence. Like what do you need like for a room or computer? Yeah. Like what's the minimum you need for kind of like a RP one thing? So you all need a room, a bed, a toilet, some some food dispenser, and then go into VR. Tiny Just spend all it. Yeah. That's it. How would the <laughs> rig work? I mean, those rigs, even in the movie, they're kind of complicated. And then even in, in the book, yeah, there's so a... much more complicated with robot arms yeah. and everything, just for them to simulate all the motions. Yeah, well, what I, what I look the at, actually, my comparison for VR is I like to compare it to TV. And I like to compare our current tech to, like, the very early, like, like big box TVs. Like, when TV came out, it was a tiny black and white screen in a giant effing box, you know. And nowadays, we have, you know, 80-inch... TV on wall that's like thinner than my finger, 
you know, the tech has advanced. So I think with the VR, it'll be the same way. It'll get to the point where it's super light and cheap and, and accessible. So I think that'll solve that problem. I mean, we're getting wireless like at the end of the year. That's already extremely insane. And that's the yeah. dream that we've had for so yeah. many years. And we're getting it at the end of the year. And then, you know, that's, that's it. That's what I wanted to mention about the Vibe Pro, too, because I, I, I joke about it, right? And it is totally a luxury. But for me, the fact that I owned a Vibe, I bought a Vibe maybe, when did it come out? Like a year or two ago? I'm bad same, with dates, but not day. that long ago, 2016. Right? 2016. 2016. Yeah, 2016. Yeah, 2016. Yeah, so it blows my mind that within this very short time period, what I'm wearing now is so much better. Like, it's just, it's just vastly better than what I had before. Um, even but though, again, I say it's not... It's it's but in that short time period and we're art so where it's progressing so fast. In terms, I, I don't it. feel like it's a it's a gigantic improvement. It's it's a step up, but it's like not two point oh, it's one point five, because it's resolution, but that's pretty much it. It's not higher refresh rate. The FOV is still terrible. Uh, the lenses are still shit. Uh, comfort is extremely good though, but otherwise yeah, it's that's just my a biggest... screen that already exists on a phone. So to me, the progress is not. Like, mm. It's not hit eight hundred dollars, like yeah. you said. It's five hundred. This but is literally yes. my thing. The price. Yeah. All right, wait, we, 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 let's start wrapping it up. So there's a couple okay. last thoughts, right, nephew Dave? Oh. So I mean, the first thing is I. So I don't know too much about Ready Player One, especially because I haven't done either the book or the movie. I'm just been sitting what? here just scratching my chin. <laughs> yes, just scratching my chin the entire time. But I, I live for computing. I literally go ahead and eat and breathe and sleep computing all day and all night. And I've been looking at the progress of CPUs and GPUs. And supposedly, we're going to make a large generational jump with the next generation of NVIDIA GPUs that can actually yield a high amount of increased performance if rumors are to be believed. But then again, that's the rumor mill. But the moral of the story is, is that we've been making strides not in CPU processing power as of the last couple of years, but mainly the name of the game has been efficiency. We've had processors go from an average TDP of 140 watts inside the desktop tower to using 5 watts or less inside MacBooks that have no fans, which means they run completely passive, just put on a chunk of metal and they're left to go cook. That being said, not only has the efficiency in terms of heat dissipation and the amount of instructions per clock just gone up massively, especially in GPUs, a GPU with a performance of a 1060, which is roughly equivalent to a 970, and if you overclocked it, we're approaching 980 territory. A 980 used to cost like $500, $600. That GPU today, before the cryptocurrency mining boom, was 250 bucks. <laughs> That, that's going to do the money boon and now <laughs> through the roof right now. But the moral of the story okay, no, is no. that as, oh, as technology as technology marches on, it becomes the great equalizer. The best of the best mm. technologies, for example, you coughing up 800 bucks for your Vive Pro, you might have coughed up that much for just to get a Vive when it came out two years ago. But I got I this for $300 from <laughs> Best Buy, and then I got mm. a sensor for like another 60 bucks. And like, I can now walk all over my room. I would get up, unfortunately, my my cord is tangled in my chair right now, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but the it's moral of the story is, is that as things become more mainstream, the, pri the cost to produce them goes down, their efficiency, their quality, everything like that will go up over time. And especially mm. as GPU technology evolves, where we can support higher resolutions and somehow have the GPU power to put out those frame rates required to drive them, only then can, can VR really take off. Because if we can't drive 4K and 2K per eye in order to help the people who can't really see as well from point and blank or at a distance improve optics and lenses so I can actually read a piece of paper without having to hold it five feet away from my face like a blind you can person. Do that in the <laughs> that's okay fine that's true but the moral of the story is, is that the vive pro is 800 dollars. this headset yes. the regular vive cost me 300 so 300 yeah by the time it's mm -hmm. but it's as, so much as mainstream as it's right as ready player yeah. one like everyone on the planet the has quality, one it's going to be incredibly yeah. cheap yes right? so like, i don't think we so have time to talk about it point. but i want so to when, do, when do we so think that'll be oh well, can we can we take a quick poll before we wrap up because we didn't get to the other question so ghoster can you pull back so you can see the votes 
questions I want to get this. So I want to ask the question about. Uh, so this this is this is the framing uh, for me. So if in the future, let let's say the world is okay. So so we're we're going to establish the world. It's not a utopia. It's not a dystopia. The world is about as it is now. It's fine. And 30 years from now, everyone is living in virtual. Basically, that's every that's that's a primary place where many people spend their time is in virtual worlds, doing virtual things with virtual friends. Is that utopian and good, or is that dystopian and bad? So if you think it's okay and good, give us a thumbs up. If you think that's we've gone off the rails, if that happens, give a thumbs down. Uh, and I'm gonna count to three, and and everybody get your get your thing. Okay, so ready? One. Is there one in between? Two, three. What? Let's see it. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> the real answer is that it's somewhere in between. I think that's yeah. someone was yeah. just saying that. We like, have a few downers. Exactly. We have a few downers who will who will soon be kicked, but the rest of you were already dead. We have to know the so players I'm gonna, involved. Uh, I'm gonna help bring it to a close cool. with something. Yeah. I'm gonna help bring it to a close. I think what the <clears throat> an, an interesting thought that I think people should think about is uh, what is the end goal of vr or what is the like the end <laughs> product of, of vr tools right like we have or the end game <laughs> oh, I, don't know, I don't know why I think it's this about title that. <laughs> but <laughs> Guys, so what it. if um like phil um mentioned like uh the the end the, the products might be you might have a space for a you know a treadmill or something like that but what if you know it's more like a uh, sorter online we have like a nerve gear type thing, you know, and we right. download our brains or or completely download our brains into an internet. So it's more yes. like, um, um, yeah, that that's know, matrix uh, level. That's not black, VR. That's more yeah, like, so it's like, more like black, like, black. Yeah. But, but when but you talk about VR, the end it's still game, virtual reality, you know, we can download it, yeah. our brains into a computer. You know, is that the end goal? You know, is is are we going to stop there? Yes. Or how are we going I to think that's beyond VR, like that? though. I think that's that's like sim. I don't know. I don't know if they're necessarily the same. But that's probably a larger. Thing. No, no. I I think yeah. that is the end goal. Like it, it like it, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard for us to per perceive it that way because we're we're wearing a bucket on our head, and we, that's not the right. same as like being right. inside the computer. But it is. We're on a pathway now that leads down that road, and like I do to sort of think that, it does lead into the matrix. Because at the end of the movie. Uh, you know, he was he was he was saying he was basically yeah, like sure. an AI or not even an AI. He said he was basically hinting that he he downloaded his consciousness into the computer mm. before he died. So you're talking about like, Halliday. You know, yeah. yeah, he's like, yeah, yeah. You're not so, an avatar. What are you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, too. You know, is that like the end? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what was so, the so, kid, though? Well, right. actually, yeah. so so real talk, just real quick. I'm I'm almost certain that was added to because Klein is writing a sequel. To Ready Player One, mm -hmm. and I'm almost certain that was put in there as a hook for the next movie, the sequel. That's that's why they put that in there. So. <laughs> crazy. Is that yeah. going to be called uh, Ready Player Two? Yeah. Still collecting. Still collecting. Um, yep. Okay, you're gonna wrap it up. Okay. This is it. Stokel. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, it it wouldn't be called virtual reality at the point where you can download your consciousness into the computer. It, it, would, it would no longer be virtual reality. It'd be alternate reality because mm. it, that would be your world at that point. No yes, I like that. That's, that's a good time. distinction. I like that. I like um, that. All Thank right. you. I think I think we're okay. good. Any final thoughts from you, Xerxes? I don't know if we cut you off at some point. No, not at all. I just wanted to say that I this is what brought me into the vet the headset that I have right now. Uh, so I am just so <laughs> I've been waiting for this night really, and I'm so happy to have you all here to talk about this and everything. Um, I have a podcast. It's called Building the Oasis. If you if you like thinking about the uh, the the virtual world and how it might exist in uh, in our society, feel free to give that a listen on iTunes. I'll leave a link to that in the the, the Discord. So yeah, thank you so much for having me up to speak tonight too. And if people haven't noticed, you have a terrific awesome. podcasting voice. It's it's it's, uh, and it's even better when you're really like good. well recorded. Thank uh, you. Wow. Well, do you have anything you want to? Uh, yes. Yeah, so so just just to reiterate, because I think Rubik has established the ground rules. Our goal is to make the world suck just enough that VR is great. And then we'll go back. So let's all let's all concentrate on that. That's that's it. That's it. We gotta, it's a fine man. VR we are great sir. again. Like, great <laughs> genocide should be done. <laughs> Uh, that's a discussion for our future show, uh, but I think, I think that's enough for tonight. So thank you very much, everybody. Oh, uh, let's uh, let's line up at the bar, or let's go to the pool table maybe and get some props, and that'll be our big picture. At the can end. we go to the stack of boxes? Why not? No, but you can go grab grab a drink, grab a prop, and bring it over here.
Why can't I grab a chair? Grab a prop. I got it. It's my cat. I want a triangle. And Ghoster, you can give us some direction if if we need to. All right. I got the cat. Oh, we both have friends. Oh, man. All right. Everybody, if you can look this way, if you hear my voice, I am behind some people, and I am over here. Look for the camera. If you get on the the other side of the table. I see you, Ghoster. Or you're on the wrong side of things. If you are a small avatar. Oh, oh. But you're sad with oh. sunglasses. You're so huge. <laughs> <laughs> right. I have an eight. It looks like we're good. Um, Man, this mm. trick looks weird. I'm, I'm thinking our phrase for tonight should be balls. for the Oasis. Uh, so yeah, on <laughs> the count yeah, of three, we're going to say uh, for the Oasis in three, two, one. Oh, yeah. For the Oasis. Oasis. Yes. Oh. This sounds like a cult or something. Goodbye, everybody. Just the cult. Congrats. <laughs> wow. Uh, thank you, man. So. Uh, yes.